Do you uh, own that uh, statement in prayer that you need the Lord? Do you own that? Okay, I, can't, I don't want to say this for the church. I'm going to say it for me. Okay, I don't want to say it for the church. I'm going to say it for me. Um, crazy week, but I'm thankful President Trump was not, uh, I'm thankful that he was acquitted. And uh, I think about where our country uh, would be, and I've learned one thing. I can't predict what's going to happen. Uh, anytime I think that I know what's going to happen, it kind of goes wonky. Uh, but I'm thankful that he was acquitted, and yet it's clear our country is uh, in a mess uh, when it comes to everything. <laughs> when it comes to, I can't narrow it down to one thing. Uh, we need the Lord. We need his help. And yet we want to remember that God is good even in the midst of all that craziness, huh? And we can trust him. And I would just want to say, even right in amongst your midst, God is good right here in this moment. And thank the Lord that we have this time together. I was blessed to be able to fellowship a little bit uh, with our people this morning. And Bar Bob and Barbara Foray, right here, I uh, got to visit with them a little bit. On Friday, they celebrated 71 years of marriage. <laughs> 71 years. Yeah. And, and I, 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 know, I know that as a habit, our church tends to recognize past some magic age. We start recognizing either every 10 or every, every 5 um, but when I hear 71 years of marriage, I kind of do feel like we've just begun, right? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing. This last week, I was telling the church, uh, I'm the one who normally remembers dates, but uh, this last year was, or this last week on uh, February 4th, my wife and I celebrated 27 uh, years since our first date. And, uh, and uh, we celebrated it by saying, hey, did you remember that? No, I didn't remember that. Yeah, well, hey. <laughs> Well, it was. Okay, well, I'm sick. Love you. Uh, and uh, it was, it's kind of like that, you know? So, uh, but praise the Lord for the church family and for God's goodness amongst you. And uh, wherever you're at in your search for God, we're glad you're here today and glad you're seeking Him. It's our goal to lift up Christ, amen, and to magnify Him. So, we come to this passage this morning, and it's chapter 2 and verse 13. I'm going to read from back back at verse 9 up to verse 13, just to give some context. And, and again, Paul is dealing with discipleship. He's dealing with the growth of the Thessalonian believers. The three main players in the Thessalonian church discipling them would have been Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. And in verse 9, he calls to them many times this aspect of their knowledge of their time of living amongst them, okay? So he says, for you remember in verse 9, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, witnesses to that fact as well, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Took a lot of time talking about verse 10 and knowing this, that we are the ones who establish our testimony. Nobody else establishes it really for us. We live our testimony out, and it is observable. And I think we have missed the boat many times on verse 10. Again, just a moment here. Not going to go back and re-preach it, except for to say this. That many times we start looking at behavioral Christianity in the idea of, well, I need to do and do and perform and perform. And I've been talking about this a little in my Sunday school class as well. And yet we know that being a believer does affect our lives, okay? But the view that Paul has here is knowing that his behavior is not just an island unto himself. His behavior affected others around him. So what he did is modeled Christ. And in essence, he was saying, this is what being a follower of Jesus looks like. And he's commending them in this passage for how they related to that, understood that, and, and were witnesses of that in verse 10. Verse 11, as you know, again, he, he immediately upon saying, you are witnesses of this, he confirms, you know this. As ye know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. The anchor of verse 11 turns to the teaching that he did amongst them. Not just of a lifestyle that could be observed, but of doctrine that could be taught. And it's important, I want to say it again, I think we do well as a church, not just to say it from this pulpit, but to say it as believers that go out from this building, doctrine matters. The teaching of the Word of God matters. And it isn't a matter of that person's opinion over there and that person's opinion over there. Everybody's got an opinion. We know that. 
But what is truth? You have to have the teaching of the truth of the Word of God. So he says, you know, we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as our Father does his children. Verse 12 was where we anchored last week. And he called them to this, that you would walk worthy of God. Now he's gone from his behavior, and he's challenging their behavior. The walk worthy of God is how we live our Christianity, how we live our worldview of walking with Christ in the world amongst us. That you would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory, and praise God, everyone who knows Jesus as their Savior, is not of this world in the sense that we're going to our Father who has saved us. Amen? So there is hope in front of us. There's encouragement in front of us. And that gives us stability right here, right now, today, that we, God has called us, and we're going to go to Him. But in that meantime, in that meantime, that we would walk worthy of the high calling of God. Amen? And I just, I really appreciate verse 12. But now we turn to verse 13. Verse 13, would you read verse 13 out loud with me? For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which ye heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So as we start into verse 13, to be grounded, to be growing, and to look forward to glory, everything that we are hoping for is bound up in this book. Everything that we're hoping for is bound up here. So these doctrines matter. So we've already made the case in previous services, previous messages in this passage, that the Word of God is to have an effect upon all of who we are, and upon all that we view, and Tuesday nights, we've been calling this a Christian worldview, doing a study on a Christian worldview. That's going to be in part uh, of the message this morning as well. Now, he commends them, and in verse 13, he is commending them along the lines of thanksgiving. It's not the first time that Paul said he gave thanks for the Thessalonian believers, but what caused him to give thanks? What caused him to give thanks? Well, here in verse 13, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing. So he's just going to relay now a testimonial ministerial point of view. And it is this, here's why we give thanks without ceasing. Because when you receive the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. Now, when we look at this point we're going to spend some time on this this morning. What I want to say to you as we begin is you cannot control how someone receives the Word of God. You can't control that. Uh, matter of fact, if you know frustration, it's when you've told someone the truth and they reject it or they oppose it. And I want to just challenge you with a few thoughts along this line that you can't control how someone receives the Word of God Secondarily, it is a choice that every individual must make, and it's happening right here in this room this morning, that throughout this room, choices are being made on whether we will receive the Word of God or not. Uh, or not. Paul was grateful that there was an open-hearted reception to the truth of God's Word, that there was a surrender to it, and how do you know that they received it? Well, you know they received it because it was having an impact upon how they lived. They, you're going to see that in the verses ahead. But as we think about this aspect this morning, I want to challenge you with this question. How will you receive the Word of God today? How will you receive the Word of God today? Let me say it differently. Will you receive the Word of God today? Now, Anytime we make arguments along these lines, speaking from Scripture, there's a tendency to, and, and I think there's a good balanced approach to this, and that is to say, well, that man is just a man. And you hear it from this pulpit often, that ownership of I, me being knowing or that I am just a man. I'm a believer like one of you. Uh, however, I want to change the conversation a little bit. And I'm going to address it this way. Um, I'm going to address it from a ministerial point of view. Why do I preach? Why am I a preacher? Um, 
when you look at a preacher from where you're sitting, you might have the view that that guy really had no problem getting in front of people and talking. Um, and I would challenge you to say that most preachers uh, were a lot like Moses, and if there was anything that they had to overcome, it was the fear of being in front of other people. So even though I might be afraid of talking to you, let me, let me give you another layer of being afraid of talking to people. In this room, this is, I don't, I don't know if this is, maybe I, uh, I'll just do it this way. In this room, there are several, I mean like, I, I've lost count, somewhere between five and eight retired pastors. Um, I've been in context before where I've been preaching and there are professors of theological schools in the, in, in, the, in the audience. How in the world do you approach that? And everybody here that has been a preacher in your past, uh, or even standing in front of others, you understand that as well. So how would it be that I would approach that? Well, I'm just going to anchor on this. I believe in the authority of the truth of God's Word. And then it, it applies to the least intellectual to the most. It applies to the youngest, to the oldest. It applies to the theological professor. It applies to the child that's in junior church right now. It applies to every one of us. And the authority that allows me to stand behind this pulpit and say anything is not based on opinion, but on the truth of the Word of God. Now, does my opinion come into play? Yes, that's where you get what Paul said in the exhorting and, and, and charging and comforting of verse 11. He was persuading them, yes, with the truth of the word of God, but he was also persuading them with his lifestyle, his beliefs, how he behaved in front of everyone. All of those were a part of his teaching, but anchored in the word of God. So we recognize when we hear that they receive the word of God, if we're going to apply that here today, the way that we want to apply the word of God in this room is to check whatever the preacher says to make sure that it is consistent with what the Word of God says. And when there's a deviation, which hopefully there will not be, but if there was a deviation, we always, always, always land on the Word of God. Amen? So that's our authority. And here this morning, I want to challenge each one of us with what are we here to do? And we're here to worship God, and we're here as well to worship God as we hear the Word of God preached. But here's the point. When you have it preached to you, nobody can make anybody in this room make it true and real for your life. That is something you will either do or not. And ultimately, it is about your relationship with God. But why was Paul a happy preacher? Because he saw in the lives of those people that there was a reception of the Word of God. Now, also within this room are preachers who have walked with churches through great conflicts. Have you ever been a part of a church with great conflicts? Yes? Are you afraid to raise your hand? Have you? Okay, I have. I'm going to tell you one of the most deflating things you'll ever do is watch Christians misbehave, challenge with the Word of God, and see them in their practice throw it out the window. Now, when I say preachers... By the way, preachers are prone to this as well, right? So all of us, as we come to the Word of God, we either will allow it to mold, shape, and change us, or we won't. Now, I'm going to get real with this. Is the Word of God changing you? Is the Word of God affecting the way you walk through this world? So here's where part of our study from Tuesday night would come into this study. And part of it is from some of the commentaries I read. The Christian worldview is not merely a note in the cacophony of human opinions. So, you know, Daniel, you have to follow me on the, on the camera. So, we would approach a worldview something like this. Um, what's that guy's name? Borok? Uh, what, what's, that, what's that funny piano player? Who, what's his name? Yeah, Victor. Don't worry, I'm not going to imitate him because I couldn't. This is how I can't imitate him. There's parts in his performance where he does something like this. And he does it by sitting on the piano, okay? I'm not going to sit on the piano. 
in this, if I was to play these, and this is, this is very akin to the three-year-old hitting the piano, right? Or this 51-year-old who can't play it very well. In that, it just sounds like a bunch of notes, which it's all the notes sounding at the same time, and we would call this disharmony. In that is just a bunch of notes vying for attention. Every one of those notes vies for attention. The reason we like um, to hear our piano players play is because they take those notes and they put them in a context that makes sense to the glory of God. Now, that isn't in a particular song, but they're in a sequence, and they make sense as they're individually called out and emphasized. We are living in a place today where there is a cacophony of voices in worldview, and what I want to challenge you with is that Christianity is different from all the noise. Christianity is different from all the noise. You see, when Christians share their faith, they do not merely give their view on life as one among the endless variety of human theories and world views. When you share your faith, you're not just one choice on a shelf for how to live a life. So I thought over how do you illustrate this. I, I, I you know, you go to the grocery store and I'm looking at the varieties of salad dressings, or I'm looking at the varieties of ketchups, and who knew there were so many? And you start making choices on why you buy that one or you buy this one, and I'm going to say that your Christian worldview is not like a choice on the shelf equal to all other choices on the shelf. But why? Is that some type of an arrogant statement that, no, we, we, we're the right one? Well, how do we know that we have the right view? You have the right view based on the authority of who Jesus is and on the authority of what Jesus has done. But here, what we recognize in the Word of God is that Paul recognized that these Thessalonian believers were receiving the Word of God as it truly was the Word of God. So let me challenge you with this as well. For years, I have noted that many believers react to the preaching or teaching to the Word of God from the preacher as he is some kind of a, uh, I often say, the Dr. Phil um, uh, from the TV Dr. Phil. He's just an opinion amongst opinions. Now, the salt or worth of a preacher is only as good as he directs to the Word of God. We understand that. But here, what Paul was thanking God for about these believers is that in their life, there was a reception of the Word of God with the value that it truly was the Word of God. Now, how, or maybe I should say this, why does he do so? Well, I'm going to read the verse again, but there's a phrase at the end. We're going to anchor on these two things. For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which does what? Effectually worketh also in you that believe. So I want to give you two E's on the word of God that is its effectiveness and its energy. That is, it is effective and it is energized. The word that is used for effectively working is energeo, and it is where we get the word, English word, energy. It means to be active, and even more pointedly, it means to be efficient. It is active and it is efficient. It does what it's intended to do, and as we're going to see in just a moment, with the power needed to do so. Now, Isaiah, in chapter 55 and verse 10, we read it this way about the Word of God being effective. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it to bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, 
So shall my word be that goeth, from, uh, goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me, even if you're not turned there, most of you know the re- next word. It shall not return unto me void. Many of you know the rest of that verse, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. The point of focusing on the effectiveness or the efficiency of the active Word of God is to know this. The Word of God is powerful and works today. Now, I I want to tell you this. It works across the spectrum. So there are many people that would say, well, I don't really, I'm not, I'm not good at giving the gospel. I don't, as a matter of fact, I don't like to give the gospel because people don't even respond. And what good is it? I mean, how long since I've seen someone say, listen, one of the best things, things that we can do is plant the seed of the word of God in someone's heart. I want to tell you that I think it was the second person I ever led to the Lord came to my door on a Sunday morning, rang the doorbell. My family wasn't home. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning. I was your typical teenage boy that I was still asleep. They rang the doorbell. Nobody else was home, and I hoped, like everybody else did, that they would go away. Then they rang the doorbell again, and then they rang it again, and then they knocked on the door. I came down to the door, opened the door, and there is Ray McClellan, a wrestling uh, um, aspiring wrestler partner with me and he says Jeff I want to know how to be saved so I get to lead Ray McClellan to the Lord and then I ask him Ray I, I knew why Ray was talking to me because Ray knew that I was a believer and, and we had talked about Christ but I wanted to know why he came that day he said just I don't know if it was the previous week but he said two ladies stopped him on the road gave him a track Uh, on the sidewalk, gave him a track and talked to him about Christ. That worked on his heart, and he came and talked to me about salvation. Those two ladies, I doubt, ever know or ever knew or ever will know the side of glory that Ray accepted Christ. But they planted the Word of God, believed the Word of God was effective, and gave it. I want to encourage you, don't be stymied when someone says they don't believe. Because the Word of God is efficient in working into someone's heart. It is also something, it is also something else you should know about the Word of God being effective. And that is, within this Word, in our ghetto, is not just the efficiency or the effectually uh, active uh, agency of the Word. But it is also connected with this, that the Word of God is powerful. So when we look at energeo, it's not a latent energy, it's not, it's not like uh, it has no power, it is energized by God himself. And so we look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. I'm going to give you a second to turn there and we'll read this verse out loud together. So what I'm trying to tell you as you're turning there is have confidence in the power of the word of God. Have confidence in the power of the word of God. Hebrews 4, verse 12, would you read that out loud with me? For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Amen? So my question for you is this. Is the word of God powerful? Well, according to this passage, it can cut sharper than really anything else can to get to where your heart issues are. Okay? Now, I want to tell you the danger practically of not believing this by an illustration. Some of you have been in this church for a while, so you will know this a little bit. I'm not putting names to it. But more than a few occasions, I've talked to believers who are struggling over some area. Many times it will involve some kind of addiction. And um, there is one particular case that stood most in my mind, not because it was unique, but because it was most clear that they were really embodying what many people do uh, in a view of the Word of God. So they came to me and they talked to me about a particular sin. And I then interjected with how God has helped me, and, and it's no mystery in my life. God helped me early on with this. 
It was the memorization of the Word of God, putting the Word of God in my mind and letting the Word of God have an effect upon my life and just memorizing and keeping after the Word of God, keeping after it. And, I'm not, and by the way, it doesn't mean I, I settled that once. I don't have to use the Word of God anymore. I use it all the time to help me behave as God wants me to behave, okay? But after I gave it, now, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some time in this, okay? So I, ho- I hope to get to the rest of the passage, but I want to flesh this out. So a very simple verse to memorize is Galatians 5.16. If you know it, quote it. If you don't, listen to it. Here's the verse. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. It's not very long, not very hard. Let's try it again, Galatians 5.16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You think you can memorize that? Some of you say, Pastor Jeff, I can't, I've, got, I've got the memory of a goldfish. I can't. <laughs> Given enough time, do you think you could stay at it and memorize that? Okay? So this would be one of the verses that in talking to this particular gentleman about, uh, I said, I think you need to learn how to walk in the Spirit and learn how to use the Word of God. So I'm going to give this verse to you to memorize, okay? And, and along with several others. Came back a week later, okay? A week later, I said, did you memorize the verse, and, and uh, there was some kind of a, yeah, well, yeah, uh, kind of. I said, well, do you know the reference? No, don't know the reference. Uh, can you try to give it? Uh, this I, um, and I would help say then, and, and basically it became that scene of uh, Andy Griffith and Barney Fife uh, working together on memory. If you don't know that, look, look it up. Um, a deep cultural reference, I know. Um, <laughs> but the point is, it was a week later, and now I'm going to ask you, did they try to memorize the passage? A little more clearly, did they try? No, they did not. All right, this went on another week, another week, another week, same thing over and again. And then in frustration, they said to me, you need to go to counseling classes to learn how to be a counselor because if you think memorizing a few verses is going to help somebody, you're sadly mistaken. I can take it, okay? It's like, and it really isn't about me. What's it about? It's about doctrine. It's about the belief in the Word of God or not believing it. And I'm going to tell you, I believe the Word of God. I believe it wholeheartedly. And by the way, my zeal in believing it doesn't give it more power. It is powerful anyway. But here's the point. If you in your life do not believe in the power of the Word of God, it will affect you not only in your doctrine, but that doctrine is going to affect, affect your practice, and you will not find victory or strength in that position. Paul was thankful for these believers because they received the Word of God as it was, the Word of God. Now, there have been many times where preachers have said things that weren't so. But when a preacher says something that is so, God's people ought to receive it. And nobody can make you. And by the way, I'm going to be like Paul. I'm thankful that many people in this room, you receive the Word of God. You let it do its work. And matter of fact, that's the call of this pulpit. The call of this pulpit is the belief in soul liberty, that it is your responsibility and your right to examine the Word of God for yourself and live your life accordingly. Let the Word of God have its work in your life. But what I'm confident of is that the Word of God is effective, it is energized, and it can do the work that it was intended to do. And I want to encourage you that God can change your life. I'm going to tell you that actively God is changing my life. And it is directly proportional to how I respond to the Word of God. And I need it every bit as much as you do. There's not two tiers here. Every one of us in this room need the Word of God. And I want to encourage you that it is powerful to do its work in your life. Now, how to use it is another discussion for another day. And there are many things that could be said there. But in verses 14 through 16, in the short time that we have, you're going to see how the Word of God worked in their lives. Okay? Now I'm going to read verse 13 again and up to 14. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, 
This is how he saw the working of the word of God in their lives. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus, in verse 15, and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. A few things to know here in the short time we have. He says, for ye brethren, the effect of the word of God had this working in their life. We have to get this point. They became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. Now the word followers is mimetes, which means to mimic, or what's the other word we use for mimicking something? To imitate or to copy. That's right. To imitate or to copy. This is at the core of discipleship. Do you understand really what discipleship is? It's, it's me. Pick, uh, Monty, you sit so close I pick on you all the time. Pick on Wes. The more intellectual of the two, right? It's me coming to Wes and saying, Wes, I want to know how to follow Jesus. And Wes says, this is how you follow Jesus. And it's not just a bunch of platitudes of good ideas. This is how you follow Jesus as we direct towards the Word of God. This is how you become a follower of Jesus. I'm going to say again, at the core of discipleship is teaching people who Jesus is, leading them to a place of receiving Him as their Savior. That's at the core of discipleship. Further from that, it'd be discipleship teaching. If I got saved, if Wes led me to the Lord, it'd be Wes telling me, did you know that God wants you to be baptized? No. Where do you see that? And he opens his Bible, Matthew 28, 19, and 20, amongst many other passages. Did you know that God wants you to be a user of the Word of God, to hide the Word of God in your, in your life? Did you know that God wants you to be in a church? Did you know that God wants you to know how to study the Word of God? And He would walk me through from the Bible how to follow Christ. And if I was a believer, I would then become a follower of two things. I'd be a follower of Wes, and I would be a follower of Jesus, because Wes would be leading me to be a follower of Jesus. This is exactly the language that Paul uses. Now, here's the point. So for so many years, we in Christianity has lost, have lost the view of personal discipleship, one for ourselves, but two for others. Everybody in this room, I hope, will be praying that God will give you somebody to disciple and maybe multiple somebodies. That you would be able to reproduce the faith, not that you created, but that God gave you in the life of someone else who wants to grow in Jesus. I would guarantee you across this room, this room is filled with people that want to grow and want to take another step in their growth for the Lord and would love to do Bible study, love to have some one -on I'm going to say again, there are many who've never done personal one-on-one -on -one Bible study with somebody else, and you've still got all these questions that nobody's answering. It comes down to Paul's statement in verse 14 that they became followers of these churches, they became imitators of them as they had learned the truths of the Word of God, as it had been modeled in front of them through Paul, Savanus, and Timothy, and Paul had then, and these three men had discipled and discipled and discipled, and now it had its fruit that these people were followers of God. This church does not need Jeff Estes. If I died today, you, as a believer, have made a commitment to be a follower of Christ, and He will lead you. Amen? The church of God is more enduring than any personality or person because it is grounded on Jesus Christ. The blessing of being a believer is that His Word is constant. It's unchanging. So when you've got questions about how to live and what to do, we have the Word of God. Amen? And it tells us God's mind. But we as believers need to be praying that God would use us in the same way that He used these three men to help others to be imitators of Christ. I'm going to say this as well. I am helped every time I help somebody else in the Word of God. When I say that, whenever we get into the Word of God together, it's a blessing to me. I grow. 
We've got to get past the idea of Christianity that you need some kind of degree to have a Bible study. Or that's for, only for the theologians. That is, God did not give his word to just theologians or to the class of theologians. God has really called all in this room. And, and can, I, can I encourage you? Really, from the nursery up, this is exactly what this church is doing. The church is trying its best to make theologians out of every one of you. That everyone in this room would know Jesus personally and be a follower of him and lead others to be followers as well. Now, how deep does this get? Well, in this passage, it gets pretty deep because it says that they suffered in their imitating these other churches because this was the epitome of what it meant for them to be imitators of them. They were facing the same thing that the Judean church was facing, and that is persecution, who both, in verse 15, killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God and are contrary to all men. It goes on further saying how they're contrary to all, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sin always, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. So what you have is those in the religious community, religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Jew, who had rejected Christ and then became jealous of this following of Christians and not only jealous but antagonistic towards him and the resulting end of that and the government was that there was a persecution upon these people so that they literally were being killed. Take your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Well, matter of fact, you can turn there. I'm going to read it for you. It's Romans 8, 36. In the midst of that passage that tells us that nothing can separate us from the love of God and that we are secure in Him, a wonderful passage, you have this stray verse that I, had ne I didn't really get in, in the beginning of my walk with the Lord. You have all these glorious things, but he says in verse 36, as it is written, Romans 8, 36, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the what? So this was, this was what was happening directly as a result of religious leaders resisting the truth, standing against it, and the government working in partnership with that, and Christians were literally dying and suffering all kinds of evil as you read about in Hebrews 11 and Hebrews 12. Just this last week, a story hits the news of some I can't remember the number. Forgive me for re not remembering the number. There were, I want to say 30 or 60, I, I'm, I'm sorry for not remembering, Christians that were slaughtered by Muslims. One story is of a pastor who was beheaded as a result uh, of this kind of persecution. And, and this one, I think, was it, yeah, you guys have to help me remember. I think it was on Tuesday night that I talked about this. So this is what I said to the church on Tuesday night. Here I was, I'm sitting in my, in my house, I've got my coffee, I'm drinking my coffee, I'm reading this story. I was reading it on my smartphone, I'm drinking my coffee, reading the story of this pastor who was killed, and I can put down that story and I can keep drinking my coffee and go throughout my day without any fear of persecution. And here's the thing, I think we need to know that it's actively happening on this planet today, and the freedoms that we enjoy right now may not be there tomorrow. And even if they aren't there, we had better make a commitment to stand for Christ. No matter what the world does. This doesn't come from uh, leaning on a crutch. This doesn't come from having a religion because you want to have a social club. This comes from the depth of having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Where he is not just my worldview, the Bible says that I am enveloped in him and he in me, that my life is lost in him. There's any number of ways the scriptures teach this. But our lives completely belong to him because he's made us, he saved us, to him we go. So no matter what happens on this planet, God has called us as believers to live for him. The fruit of that in these believers is that they were being persecuted. And you, and, and you go to John 3, 17 through 21, you can go there and we'll read that passage together. It is part of that of most famous of passages, as you know, John 3, 16. But John 3, 17 through 21, I'm going to ask you to read it out loud with me. 
We're almost done here. John 3, 17 through 21. Nobody can control how you receive the word of God. It is up to you. But in John 3, 17 through 21, would you read it out loud with me? For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. How are you going to receive the word? Now, in this room, there may be people who are not saved. You may be struggling over it. You may be wondering, if I die, I don't know where I'm going to go. The truth of how you receive the word of God is what you do with that. Will you turn in faith to Christ or not? Will you receive it? One more challenge on this. Our rejection of the truth, ready? Our rejection of the truth does not make the truth go away. The truth is the truth whether you receive it or not. Go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and listen to what it says in verse 16. It says, those who did not love the Lord and fought against the gospel, says they forbade us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up their sins always. For the wrath is come upon them. Now there's a scary phrase at the end which says to what? To the uttermost. There is no way I as a preacher can fully expound upon what it means to fall under the wrath of God to the uttermost. But when you talk about the one who has the power of life and the power of damnation, there is no greater authority anywhere, any place. And he's called all men everywhere to be saved. And we could deny that. And we could say, I don't want it. It doesn't change the fact that wrath is sitting upon that person ready to be revealed when they pass from this life and stand before him. The truth is the truth whether you receive it or not. But the great grace of God is he's offered it to you. He's offered it to everyone in this room that you can be saved. Amen? So what will you do with Jesus? How will, you, how will you respond to receiving that or not? I'm going to tell you there could be people in this room that are wondering about your salvation. I'm going to invite you right now, and here's the direct invitation. After this service, you come talk to me or talk to the person that brought you or talk to someone you trust. But I'm going to invite you after the service. If you don't know you're saved, nail down your salvation. Turn to faith in Christ. If you don't know how, let's talk. But there's the invitation. Will you respond? How will you receive it? Believer in this room, it's high time that we got past the Pandoric or the idea of that there, there's all these worldviews and that these views really don't matter here or there. Your view and your Christian worldview matters in the day that you live. It matters to the neighbor next door. It matters to the coworker. It matters to your family member. Do they see Jesus in us or do they say, hey, I can have Jesus and do what I want? Does Jesus matter to you? Is he changing your view of the world around you? Are you letting the word of God have its effect in your life? You are the only one who can make that decision and answer that question. And let me say this. I don't think it's just a one-time decision. Amen? We make this decision day after day after day after day. And why? Because all that I am and all that I hope for in the future is bound up in the person of Jesus Christ to whom I will go. 
So believer, your individual Christian life matters. Your testimony matters. Not in the sense of my judgment or even, can I say, God's judgment. That's a a different message, a different day. It matters as a follower of Christ. And I'm fully convinced that God is ready to save people, willing to save people, and willing to help people grow. And it needs to be His church that's carrying out the Great Commission. And not just that preacher or that teacher or that deacon or that really spiritual person. God has called His church to be disciple makers. God help us to rise to the occasion. And I'm going to, uh, our time is done, but I want to close just by saying this. The need is right here in this room. You may not know the person next to you, behind you, in front of you is saved. Some of you might think, well, Pastor Phil will talk to him or Pastor Jeff will talk to him. And I'm going to tell you that it may be that you're the person. I would just say, let's speak Jesus. Let's be good about speaking Jesus and ask God to magnify his name right here in this place.